Okay, welcome to Good Choices. So the last video, I just did a uh, brain health video. Um, hopefully that will help some people that had similar issues I've been having. Um, I'm on the Golden Root Supplement, and I feel like it is kicking in. I did a little bit of an exercise routine just because I felt like it, so... Uh, I feel like it's having good effects, um, but this video we're going to dive in deep and keep going on getting this cert. I think that is important. Um, so uh, yeah, in the in the last video, uh, hey, we got great news. So in the last video, I finished up topic uh, 20, topic 102. Um, so dot six uh, Linux virtualization was the final lesson. We went over some... <gasps> Cloud. <laughs> Sorry, I say that every time because it's, it's so like, uh, I feel like the industry t took a 90 degree turn away from the um, <clears throat> topic I picked when I went to school to get my associate's degree and like the certification tracks I went through. I went through the service provider service uh, track and I went through the enterprise service, the enterprise certification track. And yeah, I've worked with Python. I've worked as a uh, network developer. But I never went through like the Cisco DevNet track, the Juniper DevOps track, and I feel like I'm being left behind. I, I really feel like there's not much out there in the uh, tracks and the experience I did go through and things like <gasps> cloud are like this pristine worshipped almost to a religious point um, <laughs> fields that like it's not about how smart you are. It's about how lucky you were to have fixed, picked the path that you happened to pick. So I feel like cloud is definitely that. Um, I think AI is definitely going to be like that as well. Um, AI is looking back in five, 10 years, probably going to be uh, like cloud. And then AI has a compounding effect too. Cause if you know how to make AIs, then you know how to give yourself a special advantage all right, so um, we finished up uh, half half the training for the first test. So uh, it took me about uh, a, a month. So in, in another month, I'll, I'll be able to uh, actually take the uh, exam. So that's exciting. All right, so no time to waste. This is uh, lesson one on topic uh, 103, the second half of uh, the necessary learning material to take the first half of the, uh, take the first exam that you need to pass the LPIC. You need to take two exams, kind of like the old school CCNA. Um, so now we're gonna learn uh, work on the command line as part of Linux installation and, uh, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong, Oh, here we go. So now as part of uh, GNU and Linux commands, we're gonna learn how to work on the command line. All right, so introduction. Newcomers to the world of Linux administration and the bash shell, which is not me, often feel a little bit lost, but that is me, <laughs> without the reassuring uh, comforts of the GUI interface. That is definitely not me as is a, <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, that is, I feel lost with the freaking GUI interface, things popping up all over the place. Like, look at this, I go like that, everything here changed, I can't see it. Like, on a, on a CLI, you have a history of everything you did. Like, you don't have the history of, what was this again? It changed. I, I feel, I feel like the GUI interface is chaotic and it's a nightmare. The CLI, I feel better on. They're used to having right-click access to the visual cues and contextual information that graphic file manager utilities make available. So it is important to quickly learn and master the relatively small set of command line tools through which you can instantly tap into all the data offered by your old GUI, which stands for graphical user interface, and more. All right, get, getting system information. While staring at the flashing rectangle of a command line prompt, your first question will probably be, where am I? That's a good question. Or more precisely, where in the Linux file system am I right now? And if, say, I created a new file, 
where would it live? What you are after here is your present work directory. I thought it was present working directory, but present work directory is what it says. And the PWD command will tell you what you want to know. So here uh, we're at the home directory of someone named Frank. Let's see where I am, where I happen to be in my lab. Uh, so this is not my lab. This is my uh, home PC. So let's see where I am. Okay, I'm at uh, uh, in my Windows uh, files. All right, so let's do a CD. Now see where that places me. All right, so places me in my uh, WASL files, Windows Subsystem for Linux, home directory in my WASL, which is kind of like a virtual machine. All right, now let's go to my home lab, which I don't need to put my password in for, which is amazing, because I'm using the key. And let's see where I am. All right, I'm in my home directory. Assuming that Frank is currently logged into the system and he is now in his home directory, slash home slash Frank, should Frank create an empty file using the touch command without specifying any other location in the system, the file will be created within the slash home slash Frank, or within, within slash home dash Frank. Listing the directory contents using ls will show us that new file. Okay, so let's try that on my home lab. Touch new file, ls, and there it is. I'm gonna remove it. I don't want messy files on there. Besides your location in the file system, you will often want information about the Linux system you are running. This might include the exact release number of your distribution or the Linux kernel version that is currently loaded. The uname tool is what you are after here. And in particular, uname using the dash A all option. So uname dash all, we can see they're using a uh, Ubuntu machine. They're using 18.04, classic, classic, classic version. Um, let's see what I'm using. I'm also using, uh, oh, that's interesting. No, I'm not. So I'm using Ubuntu. Um, so I'm using dot 15 here, and then I don't have uh, the same specification that they have here. I just have number 208. Interesting. Here, uname shows that Frank's machine has the Linux kernel version 4.18.0 installed. I have the version 4.15.0 installed and is running Ubuntu 18.04 on a 64-bit x86 underscore 64 CPU. So I am running, uh, it doesn't say, which is strange. Um, and then I'm, uh, it also doesn't seem to say uh, how many bits. Because here we have, um, Oh, no, okay, this, this this is probably for each uh, processor. So he's got uh, three processors. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know what that is. Let me let me ask some questions to the AI. I always forget that I can do that, and it just, it just makes so much sense. And the GPT 3.5, I find it's usually fine, especially for simple stuff like this. So the output you provide indicates that the system you are using is running on Linux with the Ubuntu operating system. The specific version is Ubuntu 4.15, okay, which is based on the, let's see part, okay. Why are there three parts? That's the first question I'm gonna ask it. Why is listed shown three times in the command because I, I have like a lot of CPUs so the x86 appears three times in the output because it represents the CPU architecture of the system from three different perspectives the output uh, that shows it three times in the output that shows it three times the first occurrence indicates 
the machine hardware architecture. The second occurrence represents the hardware platform, and the third occurrence represents the operating system user land, the software environment in which user programs run. Okay, that's that's weird. So first occurrence is the hardware architecture, second occurrence is the hardware platform, and the third occurrence is the uh, system user land. So here's a breakdown of each occurrence. Machine uh, hardware architecture, which they... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm not that interested in this. I'm just going to move on. I don't think this is relevant to the test, and it's just kind of into the weeds a bit. Um, so let's say, uh, why doesn't it show... Why didn't the output show my version of Ubuntu? So the output you provided, you named dash A, displays the kernel version and some additional, but the, yeah, okay. So yeah, there's two ways to do it. Uh, so now we can see it's uh, 1804. Uh, we can also do it like this. Oh, that's wrong. Okay, so 1804. Um, so I don't know if this is like a typo or something. Because this, this should not be there. Maybe it's different in there because I'm still using a different version of the kernel and a different version of Ubuntu. They're using 0 0.1 instead of 0.6. But um, yeah, this is, this is suspect. Okay, so here Uname shows that Frank's machine has the Linux kernel version 4.18.0 installed and is running Ubuntu 18.04 on a 64-bit x86 underscore 64 CPU. And it also shows the uh, machine infrastructure, the, the machine architecture. It shows the um, machine hardware architecture. It shows the hardware platform and it shows the operating system user land which is beyond the scope of this certification, as far as I know. But it could be in the next one. All right, next section, getting command information. You will often come across documentation talking about Linux commands with which you are not yet familiar. Ooh. The command line, mysterious. The command line, it's like a mystery novel. The command line itself offers all kinds of helpful information on what commands do and how to effectively use them. Perhaps the most useful information is found within the many files of the MAN system. As a rule, Linux developers write MAN files and distribute them among the utilities they create. MAN files are highly structured documents whose contents are intuitively divided by standard section headings. Typing man followed by the name of a command will give you information that includes the background name, a brief usage synopsis, a more detailed description, and some important historical and licensing background. Here is an example. So uh, we can get some information on the uname command. Uh, let's do that in my home lab. Um, so we can see we get certain system information. I wonder if we could get, so this is mostly about the kernel, it looks like. Uh, maybe maybe we can get that version if we do a dash O, let's try it. Dash version, does that work? No. I think that's the version of Uname, not the version of Ubuntu. Yeah, and dash A gives us all of this anyway, so 
it's just not the correct command to use if you want to know your version of Ubuntu, unless you're using, unless this is due to the fact that they are running a different version of the kernel and a different version of Ubuntu than I am. All right, man only works when you give it an exact command name. If, however, you are not sure about the name of the command and are after, oh, the, if, yeah, if you're not sure about the name of the command you are after, you can use the apropo, apropos command to search through the man page names and descriptions. Does that seem familiar to anybody who's familiar with this channel? Yes, that command exists on Juniper boxes, which are just Linux free BSD boxes. Assuming, for instance, that you cannot remember that it is uname that will give you your current Linux kernel version, you can pass the word kernel to um, apropos. Let's get a, let's get a, um, I think I've done this before. Apropos. Apropos, that's right. Sorry, that was way louder than I was expecting. Uh, yes, I remember. Apropos, the S is silent. You will probably get many lines of output, but they should include these. So, apropos kernel. So, yeah, we got all kinds of output, um, but um, the specific ones are uh, some system D output, you name, and you random. I'm sure we got that in there somewhere. Here's you random, here's you name. And, uh, yep, so we got all three of those, but we got all kinds of other ones. If you do not need a command's full documentation, you can quickly get basic data about a command using type. This example uses type to query four separate commands at once, which, th so the results show us that cp for copy is a program that lives in slash bin slash cp and that kill change the state of a running process is a shell built in meaning that it is actually a part of the bash shell itself so here we go type you name let's see what that looks like Uh, yep, so it's hashed. Um, it's in here. It's a built. Now, this is really powerful because if you, because like, uh, you know, if it's a built in, it's a little, it's a little bit different. Like, you know, it's, it's important to know um, the type of command it is. Notice that besides being a regular binary command like CP, uname is also hashed. This is because Frank recently used uname. Oh, okay, got it. And to increase system efficiency, it was added to a hash table to make it more accessible next time you run it. So hash tables we should know a bit about from uh, the JNCIESP as well. If he would run type you name after a system boot Frank would find that type once again describes you name as a regular binary so so if you did not um, already run it it would not be hashed and, and ready to go again so we already ran um, the command you uh, name so if we run the type on it to see what type of command is it uh, we can see it's a hashed command of type executable that exists in the for such bin for such you name. Uh, now let's do a command we did not run yet. Oh, and it, yeah, it says that it's hashed. So echo is not a hashed one. So we're going to go echo hello world. Okay, and now we'll check the type of echo, and it's, what? You know, maybe because it's a um, shell built-in, it doesn't hash, because it's, like, already optimized. So let's let's try something that's not 
that's not hashed. So let's do let's do type ls. Um, okay, so ls is a is an alias command. Oh, I can't think of a. How about how about um, type ps? Okay, so it's perfect. This is the same type of command as uname. It's it's an executable that uh, exists in this uh, in the bin directory. So if I do ps, uh, I bet you it'll be hashed. Boom. Okay, got it. Note a quicker way to clean up the hash table is to run the command hash dash d. Why would you ever want to clean up the hash table? That makes no sense. Uh, I'm going to ask the AI. So why would you ever want to All right, so in computer science, cleaning up the hash, cleaning up a hash table, oops, okay, there we go, may be necessary for various reasons. Here are a few common scenarios where cleaning up a hash table is beneficial. Okay, yeah, I can think of this one, but I'm not sure how much memory that would actually consume. It seems pretty efficient. Hash tables consume memory to store key value pairs. If the hash table is no longer needed or if it contains unnecessary or outdate, outdated data, Cleaning up the hash table frees up memory resources for other operations or improves overall system performance. Data integrity. Hash tables are often used to store cached data or maintain lookup tables. Over time, the data in the hash table may become invalid, stale, or inconsistent. Cleaning up the hash table ensures that only valid and up-to-date data is stored, improving data integrity and reliability. Resource optimization. In some cases, a hash table may have excessive or redundant entries, resulting in slower lookup times or increased processing overhead. Cleaning up the hash table removes unnecessary entries, optimizing the resource utilization and improving the overall efficiency of the data structure. All right, security and privacy. Hash tables can be used to store sensitive data, such as user credentials or personal information. Cleaning up the hash table ensures that this sensitive data is properly cleared from memory, reducing the risk of unauthorized access or data breaches. The specific reasons for cleaning up a hash table may vary depending on the application, the data being stored, and the requirements of the system. It's important to regularly assess and manage the contents of a hash table to ensure its optimal performance and data integrity. So let's run the hash dash D and take a look at the type of uname and PS and make sure that they're unhashed. All right, and they're both still hashed, even though I did... Um, Oh, you know what? I think I think I have to. There's more to that command uh, dash d. So let's do uh, hash dash dash help um, dash d. So forget the remembered of each location name. So we got this. Uh, uh, okay, I don't know the name here. Uh, so we got to determine and remember the full path of the name. Uh, let's try this. So hash dash d. Uh, uname type uname okay so now it's no longer hashed if we run it it's now hashed again so you don't need to give the full path uh, if you're deleting it just the command name um, in order to delete the hashing um, you would want to delete the hashing in pretty rare scenarios I guess if you're dealing with uh, some security issue or um, memory is like really low on a device. Yeah, I think for the most part, you probably don't want to delete hashes, but there are some really edge cases. 
All right, so sometimes, particularly when working with automated scripts, you may need a simpler source of information about a command. The which command that our previous type command traced for us will return nothing but the absolute location of a command. This example locates both the uname and which commands. Okay, so which, uname, which. Um, so what we're doing is we're locating... Uh, Okay, so, so what we're doing is we're getting a simple source of information about a command, which we can do with the which command. Um, our uh, type command traced for it. Um, it will return nothing but the absolute location of the command. So I guess I guess there's two ways. Um, so so you can use the type on your name, and you can use the which on your name. So yeah, if you're doing uh, scripting like with Python, um, you're gonna get back, it's, it's gonna be better to do, so let's go into Python and let's do import OS, or sorry, let's do import uh, sub uh, process. So if we do uh, 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 test equals process uh, dot check, output uh, and then uh, type you name uh, shell equals true because we're not that concerned about security in this case probably not the best way to do it and then we do a print uh, test you know that's annoying that's that's just annoying you have to if, if you want if you want to get let's say you're only concerned about that path you have to do dot split uh I, is um and then the which i mean this is a valid way if you get the job done you get the job done for god's sakes um negative one uh, and then um, <clears throat> dot replace or dot strip probably in case there's extra spaces dot replace uh, dash n uh, for nothing uh, and then close the, there we go now you so you could do that or um, you can just use the command that's set up for scripting auto optimization which is the which command so those are your two options uh which option looks better this option um oh uh, it looks like you probably still have to do the replace if you don't want that extra new line in there but um you don't have to do all of this uh up to here you might have to do all of this Okay, so that's the which command. It uh, produces only the most relevant information you need when you're doing something like scripting. It's it's basically a streamlined version of the output. It's like an abbreviated version, the short version. Note, if you want to display information about built-in commands, you can use the help command. All right, using your command history, you will often carefully research the proper usage for a command and successfully run it along with a complicated trail of options and arguments. But what happens a few weeks later when you need to run the same command with the same options and arguments but cannot remember the details? Rather than having to start your research over again from scratch, you will often be able to recover the original command using history. And I use that all the time. Typing history will return the most recent commands you have executed with the most recent of those appearing last. You can easily search through those commands by piping a specific string to the grep command this example will search for any command that included the text bash underscore history. So let's see if I issued a command like that. I don't think I did. 
Uh, oh, oh, well, I just issued it, so <laughs> it counts. Uh, and they're they're actually missing that from uh, their output. So here is a single com here a single command is returned, along with is sequence number uh 1605 um even though two commands technically should appear because because you just entered that and it, and it shows up in your history and speaking of bash underscore history it is actually the name of a hidden file you should find within your user's home directory since it is a hidden file designated as such by the dot that precedes its file name it will only be visible by listing the directory contents using ls with the dash a argument. So we'll see if we do the ls uh, on my home, uh, which uh, we can use that pw command that we learned about earlier to see that I'm there. Then do ps, um, we can see all the files that aren't hidden. And then ps.a, we see all the files that are hidden as well. Um, we do have that uh, bash history. Uh, so let's look at it myself. All right, so here it is catted out. Uh, what is in the bash history file? Take a look at yourself. You will see hundreds and hundreds of your most recent commands. You might, however, be surprised to find that some of your most recent commands are missing. That is because while they are instantly added to the dynamic history database, the latest additions to your command history are not written to the .bash history file until you exit your session. You can leverage the contents of the history of history to make your command line experience much faster and more efficient using the up and down arrows on your keyboard. Hitting the up key several times will populate the command line with recent commands. Um, yep, and not only that, uh, there's these macros here. Um, so if, if you do this uh, twice, then you get the thing you, you entered previously. So if we enter this cat command and we do this twice, we can enter that again. Um, so just whatever is in your history, um, the uh, very last one you entered can be uh, entered in with this. And then um, you can pick out any one. So let's enter that PS again. Uh, by preceding it with the same character, the exclamation point. So I use that all the time. I find that to be super helpful. When you get to the one you would like to execute a second time, you can run it by pressing enter. This makes it easy to recall and if desired, modify commands multiple times during a shell session. So another huge, um, uh, amazing thing that you can probably do um, is, uh, and I got to close this, I accidentally clicked on it. Um, so this, this file here, now that I'm just making this up from, from scratch, but, um, you can go in. So if we go, uh, use Vi, cause Vi is wonderful. Everyone loves it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, what, what's a command that we want to use all the time? Uh, that's kind of annoying to, uh, type out um i can't really think of one actually um what about um oh yeah the commands really aren't that hard to top out to type out um let's say let's say we're doing an upgrade or something and we want to constantly see this command everywhere all the time we just want to keep entering that command so you paste it in here then you go wq and now, if you ever want to run that command again, boom. Okay, well, never mind. I guess that doesn't work. Oh, you know what? It only... Okay, yeah, it doesn't go back that far. Okay, so th these are just commands that show up in your... So if we were to go like this and hold it down, uh, the very first command will ne would now be that. These are just these are just commands in your uh, CLI buffer. Um, 
where you push the up and down arrows. Uh, they're not uh, commands that you can use with the exclamation point macro, unfortunately, because that macro is amazing. All right, so guided exercises. Use the man command to determine how to tell apropos to output a brief command so that it outputs only a brief usage message and then exits, which can be useful for scripting if you want to make... Uh, like an automated guide for like how to do something. So we're going to use the command, the command man. There we go. And we just want to have it be brief. So definitely not going to be dash V. Um, hmm. Interesting. Which one will it be? Okay. I prefer dash dash help because then you're not stuck in this output. Um, but the exercise says to use this, so let's use it. Um, this is annoying. Doesn't say. I guess I'm just going to use uh, help. Should get basically the same thing. So what we're trying to get is I'll put a to I'll put a brief command so that it, it only outputs a brief usage message and then exits. Uh, oh, here we go. I found it. Dash dash usage. Perfect. So let's get the apropos on uh, uh, PS. I'm going to go dash dash usage. Uh, I did not spell that right. There we go. Uh, dash dash usage PS. Oh, I think it's got to be the other way around. Uh, I'm confused. Okay, let's do it on VG scan. Dash dash usage. What the heck? You know what? I think I think the answer is just apropos dash dash usage because that is uh, outputs only a brief usage message and then updates. Because if you do, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's the command I'm going with. I'm I'm betting a hundred on it, a hundred bucks. Um, yep. So there we go. Dash dash usage. Got it. So all you have to do is do apropos dash dash usage, and you get basically another kind of help menu. I don't know why you would need that. Um, I guess it would make sense to have an option like that for uh something like um you know information about these, but uh, maybe something like you could um, abbreviate this section here, but that's not how it works. It looks like a dash dash usage is just another help menu that you don't really need because you've got uh, this help menu here, and then you've got the manual page. So I'm not sure what the use what the use of that dash dash usage really is. Okay, so use the man system to determine which copyright license is assigned to the grep command. Easy. Man grep. So the copyright license. Uh, 
Okay, this might be a little bit trickier. We might need to use some sort of uh, switch on it. We'll do a pipe grep copy. Oh, nothing. Uh, oh, here's a uh, usage. Oh, no, this is the same thing where it's just another help menu. Copyright. I don't see that. So we've got help. We've got version. Uh, pattern file. Ignore case. Interesting. I do not see where. Yeah, this is not a thing. How do the copyright information? That's crazy. Oh, here we go. Yeah, it's just a section of of the man page. So the copyright is 1998 through uh, 2000, and then most recent copyright date is 2017, probably because this is an older version. If we had the, ver the newest version of Ubuntu, we'd probably see this up until uh, more recently. It's a free software, see the source for copying conditions. There's no warranty, not even for merchantability or, or fitness for a particular purpose. All right, let's take a look at the answer. And which, which copyright license is assigned? Uh, it's a license from the Free Software Foundation, Inc. So run man grep, scroll down to the copyright section of the document. Note that the program uses a copyright from Free Software Foundation. Perfect. All right, explorational exercises. Identify the hardware architecture and Linux kernel being used on your computer in an easy to read output format so that would be uh, you name I believe uh, and then it would be uh, uh, I th I'm gonna go with you name dash a that's what we learned about um, So run the command O and read. Okay. Oh shoot! No, I got this wrong. Um, so in order to get the easy format, so run man you name read through the description section and identify the command arguments that will display only the exact results you want. Note how dash V will give you the kernel version and dash I will provide hardware platform. So you know if you were doing it in Python. It's the same thing. Uh. Okay, so you can either do it this way and then have uh oh, I, I just did a duck call. I need to do a check output so that I actually say so that call would be like if you just want to print it out and you don't you don't care about saving it to a variable if, but I, I would rather save it to a variable because then I can play around with the variable so yeah so so in order to get the freaking um, version and the architecture you know you have to do something like test dot split like this and then you have to magically know you know, it's it's the zero one, it's it's at the second index, so okay, great, you get it, you get it like that, or you can do it um, like this, 
and uh oh that's the um or you can do it like wait what i'm looking for the kernel version so it's probably dash k uh what Dang. There we go. Oh, it's dash V. Well, I did dash V. You know what? It's probably the kernel name. What? How do I not... Hardware platform? Is that it? No dash I. Uh, maybe dash O? I'm so confused. What? I want the... Okay, so... You know, this is the whole thing. It's like... <sighs> programming's not about being clever. It's not about using the fewest number of characters. It's not about getting something in the cleanest, most simple way possible. It's about getting the job done, in my opinion. So, like, okay, great, you can just use a switch like this. But are you getting what you need? Like, with this, you know, really convoluted uh, way of, of parsing through this output here, you know, I got what I needed here. I, I don't see... I don't see the switch to how to get that. Where Where is that? I guess I'll try them all one by one. Um, and I'm not going to do it here because... So first we're going to try dash S. We know that's not it. Then we're going to try dash N. We know that's not it. R... Oh, here we go. It's dash R, kernel release, which is different from the kernel version. And anyone in the world would know that. It's just me. It's just me who doesn't know that. All right. So uh, there we go. Um, you got to narrow it down to get the cleaner input. Um, so that's the answer. All right, next question. Print out the last 20 lines of the dynamic history database and the uh, bash uh, history file to compare them. Okay, so the, printing out the last 29s. So uh, what we got to do is uh, cat um, and then uh, so the cat, the bash history. So so to print, print out a history, we just do history like that to print out the last 20 lines let's take a look uh, let's look at the manual page because that that's like pretty sloppy this is this is less sloppy Okay, I do not see how to do this. The offset, is that it? What if I just do history 20? Would that work? I hope that's not what would work because that's annoying. That would be that simple and so hard to figure out such a simple thing from reading this documentation. Oh, yeah, that is the answer. <laughs> Damn it. Oh my God. Okay. So that's what you can do um, for that. And then for bash history, 
is it that way uh let's do let's do this and then we'll do the dash wc yeah 20 dash wc tells you 20 okay so let's do a cat bash history um and then we'll do uh i think it's dash b isn't it gotta do a dash help on that Oh, yeah, I thought it was uh, dash B. Uh, no, that's just to have numbers. Uh, I think... Um, Yeah, so here's, here's all the commands I can do. WC should be on here. These are all the built-ins. Uh, WC is not on there. So you can do app pro. Oops. Built. Bash built-ins. Okay, we should we should see like a um, command to uh, so we can do like a pipe trim twenty or something like that, right? That should work. Ah, uh, I don't see it. I think, like, cut. Uh, or trim. Uh, cut the lines and just have the last 20 lines. Uh, hmm. This is a this is a good one. Oh, I don't need that. Oh, here we go. So here's all the built-in commands. So. Break, complete, continue, declare, val, export, history, if, jobs. Where's WC? I guess WC is not a build-in command. Um, but we can figure that out using which. Okay, and now we can list out all the commands there. Okay, so WC is, is in there. Uh, maybe we can do a, a man on this. Uh, it's a directory. Um, so I guess we just gotta get lucky and find a command to, to trim it down. Oh, there's view. What does view do? Oh, it's it's Vi. God damn it. Now I have to know how to exit out of here. There we go. Okay. Um uh you know what? Let's uh get the answer on this. I have no idea. 
Tail. God damn it. I knew that. I absolutely knew that. So, history 20, tail dash n 20. That's esoteric. They did not go over tail. All right, we can see they're different because these are the commands uh, that will. Uh, these are the commands you entered last. And they'll be so like if I do an up arrow, um, it's gonna match this file. But these are the commands that are that are saved to your history. So like there'll be a point where these two files converge, but, um. It doesn't converge right away. Okay, so use the apropos tool to identify the man page. Where you'll find the command you need to display the size of an attached physical block device in bytes rather than megabytes or gigabytes. There we go. So let's do that. So apropos bytes. Um, so, uh, little buffer or random flights, checksum. Interesting, I don't see it there. Um, we can do block. Uh, is this it? Show with an M. Is this it? Wait, why is that not a command? Why is that not a command? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I need to be guided through this. Okay, so one way would be to run apropos with the string block, which I tried. Read through the results and note that ls block lists block devices. So I did that. And I do not see... Oh, I see it down there. Ah, oh, dang it. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to note that because there's so much output. Um, and, then, and then from there, I mean, I already know. It's ls... BL, BLCK, it's not, it's not even BLOCK, it's LS BLK, dash dash help, um, and then uh, we can see it in bytes with the dash B. There we go. Okay, read through the results. Uh, so that's a bad way because there's so many results. Note that LS block lists block devices and therefore would be the most likely tool for our needs. Run man ls blocks, scroll through the description section, and note that dash b will, see I don't like using man, I, I like dash hash help because it prints it right out to your terminal, it doesn't take you to that special paginated thing that's like annoying to scroll through. You can just use, you can't really use your scroll wheel on your mouse as easily. So I like dash hash help a lot better. Uh, finally run ls block dash b to see what comes out. There we go, we did that. Um, okay. Last section of this reading. In this lesson, you learned how to get information about your file system location and OS software stack, how to find help for command usage, 
how to identify the file system location and type of command binaries, how to find and reuse previously executed commands. The following commands were discussed in this lesson. PWD, print the path to the present uh, work directory or working directory they say now. Uh, uname, print your system's hardware architecture, Linux kernel version distribution and distribution release. Man, access help files documenting command usage. Type print the file system location and type for one or more commands, which print the file system location for command, history, print or reuse commands that you have previously executed. All right, so uh, made it through. Let's see how long the video is. Uh, oh, hour, but good. I like that. I like that length. So uh, stay tuned for the next one where we work on the command line.